All right, let's continue. Uh, Marvin, you had a good question during the break. You were asking about uh, the order of things, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're saying, well, once the power goes through, or once basically the instruction goes through and turns this on, why do we have this here? Because we've already gone through the program. Is that sort of where you were going with it? Yeah. Okay. Here's the key. Remember, think about plugging in a light. When you plug in a light, you make contact, and current just continuously flows, right? That's the way you need to think about this. It's very different from regular programming. The best way to think about this is as if we have power just waiting to flow. As soon as we make contact, it just keeps flowing as long as it can. So don't think of it as, although this is kind of true, but kind of not, okay? Don't think of it as going by line by line by line, and once we've gone through all of this, we don't go back and look at it again, okay? I'll explain how a PLC scan probably next time or so, but for right now, think of it as power just waiting to get through here constantly, okay? So as soon as power manages to find this route, there's gonna be more flowing through, right? It'll keep going through. In fact, it'll go through both branches, once it's going through here, because this pulls this in, right? And then as soon as we release the start button, it still has a path, so it just continues to flow through. So think of it as a, more of an electronic circuit, less of a program, okay? Yeah. Would it be incorrect to think about it like just running the program over and over and over again? And that's seeing actually if what changing. happens, right? Yes. In fact, that's what scanning is all seeing about. Seeing things actually, conditions are changing right. to where it's not going to, so instead of it just being program command, the command exists, it's going to constantly be running. That's back exactly how it works, yeah. It's constantly scanning through this over and over. A normal programming language, usually what you do is you, you can make a flow chart, right? This happens so it goes to this part of the code and does that. You can make a PLC do that. But the better way to think of it is that it's just constantly evaluate this from, evaluate the next, evaluate the next, and go back over and start again. Just do that continuously. So is it just checking to see if the start button is yeah, it checks the start button, it checks the stop button, and based on that, sets the output or input. And now notice, what it's really doing is it's calculating this output based on this input. Okay. If you think about it, it's this and this, isn't it? If both of these are true, then the output is true. Now really, it's this or this result and it with this. But we're getting into Boolean algebra or Boolean logic, which is good. That's part of, part of the course a little bit later. But yeah, it's good. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, I guess, call out or the output on the, the far right. Yeah, over here. Yeah, when you pick the uh, the Y001, did you have to add anything to the bit memory address? <coughs> it says optional, or does it automatically link those two? Uh, I'm not sure address? what you mean. Let me throw in another output and see what it says. Are you saying uh, bit memory address one? Two bit memory address optional. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. I just put something in address one. Okay. And so that will link it. The output will automatically link to the. That's right. Because see how it's labeled here, Y zero zero one. Okay. That's what makes the link to that particular okay. point. Yeah. Now I can use this somewhere else. Here's a really bad idea. And they even give me a warning. Warning: It is recommended to use another memory address. The memory address Y zero zero one is used by another output instruction already. That's a very serious warning, and I'll explain why a little bit later. For right now, just know that it's a bad idea to have multiple rungs that have the same output. Okay? There are cases where it's okay. This is not one of them, okay? All right, there is another learning module that you can go into. It's the Programmable Logic Controller. Uh, introduction, and what I've done is open up the first presentation that is uh, programmable logic controllers. So let's go into that. So basically this is kind of what a PLC looks like. You've seen some, there's some in front of you. They come in many different shapes and sizes. We'll talk about that as well. But PLCs are basically the most common computer used in industrial control. Okay, so they're kind of like your computer your laptop or your desktop or whatever in the sense that they have a microprocessor, they have memory, they have input and output. But if you think about it, how would you wire up a push button switch to your, your laptop? There's not really a good way to do that, right? Maybe you could connect a joystick. And so you, now you've got a whole bunch of, of buttons. But then you have to have the drivers and the program has to use it, right? It's not like you're really able to do much with a button even once you connect it. 
I had the same problem. I don't know if you guys remember Dance Dance Revolution. Mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> I actually play it, <laughs> which is weird. Here I am, a 45-year-old guy, and I love Dance Dance Revolution, okay? But uh, I actually went to the extent of building my own set of dual pads. So I don't know if you know the difference between DDR and Pump It Up. Pump It Up has corner pads, so the directions are angled, whereas, uh, uh, and plus you got a button in the center. But then regular Dance Dance Revolution has forward, back, left, and right. Now you also need start and select buttons, so I ended up putting 9, 10, 11 buttons on each uh, pad position, okay? You guys all know what I'm talking about when I say these dancing games, right? Okay. All right, so anyway, the way I did it, since I'm cheap, is I went and I got an old keyboard, a USB keyboard that I didn't know. No, actually, it was a PS2 keyboard. I take it back. I'm, this was really old. And if you think about it, a keyboard has a whole bunch of switches in it, right? So I just tied in to whichever letters I wanted to represent. To, to use for the game, and I went down to Lowe's and I bought a, a roll of flashing. Now this flashing, if you know what that is, it's a roll of steel or aluminum, I bought the steel version, that has um, galvanized covering on it, okay? And when you buy the roll, it's about so long or so wide, maybe about a foot or so wide, and when you, you take the metal off of the roll, it's Oh, probably 15 thousandths thick, maybe less, I don't know, I've never measured it. But basically it retains sort of this, this curved shape from being on the roll. So what I did is I cut two pads that were essentially square, and they were each about 12 by 12, and put them together where they were set up to be curved, right, where their natural curve kept them separate. I put tape all around the outside edge so they didn't make contact electrically. And that way when I stepped in the middle of the pad, they would flatten out in contact, but they were kind of like springs and they'd open up. Turned out that when you press them together, they would stay together too long. It took a long time for them to separate, so I had to drill holes in them so the air could get back out and they could respond quickly. But it worked really well. So I made all these switches out of these pads and I had my own dance pads. Okay, they've, they've broken since then, so I haven't played for a while. Although I did go over the summer uh, with a friend to one of the arcades in Louisville that had a pump it up thing. And I played on that, I never lost. I could have just kept playing. It was pretty <laughs> awesome. I was like, yeah. I wasn't on the hardest level, but I could maintain my own with it. Anyway, so, uh, but the problem I had was, how do you get switch contact into the computer? Because I want to play my game. In the same way in industry, how would you get switches into a computer? It's not really set up for that, right? An Arduino is, for example. Raspberry Pis are fairly easy to connect to. But PLCs are super easy to connect to. If you think about it, you've got places, right, contact points, right on the front of the PLC made to connect to things. So PLCs are really good at interfacing with a bunch of different inputs and outputs that are on-off type inputs and outputs. So it really is the same kind of structure, but it's much easier to interface to. Now this particular one is a GE controller. There's many different uh, manufacturers out there. Uh, Siemens and Rockwell are the two big Cadillac brand names. GE is pretty close. Omron's pretty good. Uh, I can't even think of who else. There's a ton of manufacturers. The Click Coyos we're using are what's called entry-level PLCs. They're very cheap, not as reliable, and not as robust as your typical Siemens and Rockwell, but who really cares when the process you're trying to control is not critical. Um, so anyway, it's, it's in the sense that it has a microprocessor and memory and all those sorts of things, it's very similar. Now, you typically don't have a hard drive in these things. You have what's called non-volatile memory. So when you shut the PLC off, unlike your computer, Windows has to boot back up, right? But in a PLC, it'll, it'll, it's more like the memory on your thumb drive. It doesn't get erased. Okay? There are sections of it that are erased. Don't worry about that. Your program stays in memory, and when you turn it on, it's ready to go. It doesn't have to load off of a hard, hard drive or anything. Okay. Now, what do programmable logic controllers replace? Well, remember I said that with relays, there's really two functions of relays. There's the function of amplification or passing larger current. Right? The other function is logic, though, being able to do things like comparisons or um, uh, and statements, or statements, memory, all these things. And this is actually a set of ice cube relays set up and they're programmed by the way the wires are connected. This is a mess. How would you like to get in here and figure out what that thing does? Especially when there's a problem and then figure out what wire needs to be moved and fixed it. That doesn't sound like any fun at all to me, okay? As a matter of fact, this is the kind of control that PLCs were designed to replace. Okay? Because you can, looking at this rat's nest of wiring, there's probably no way you would figure this out. Anybody that was actually going to work on this, the first thing they would do is draw a ladder diagram 
and figure out what's connected where. That way they can understand what it's supposed to do, figure out why it's not doing that, and then change it so that it does. So they can write a PLC program. And so why not get the PLC? Because <laughs> see, as soon as you've got, you know, 10 relays or so, you could have bought a PLC for that price. These relays aren't terribly expensive, but they're not cheap and they do add up. A PLC has equivalent of millions of relays in it. So if all you really need to do is a bunch of logic, the PLC is by far the better way to go, okay? Believe it or not, there are still some relay control panels out there in industry just waiting for you to come along and switch over to PLC. And the first time you have a problem with it, you know what you're going to do? You're going to switch it over to PLC for sure, okay? <laughs> yeah? That was one of my coworkers at Jasper. That was one of his biggest jobs was replacing a lot of that stuff with PLC. They did use a lot of Raspberry Pis and Arduinos, which I thought was very interesting. That is interesting, yeah. 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 Why were they, so they were getting away from Raspberry Pis and Arduinos? No, they were using them. them okay. Of, they wanted everything to be more PLC and programmable controlled and stuff. Yeah. So they, they weren't just using the Raspberry Pi, the microcontrollers, but they're sure. also using PLCs as well, yeah, but yeah. there's a lot of that equipment still left. The, oh yeah, yeah, and there's a lot out in industry. If you go over to Louisville, a lot of the skyscrapers or tall buildings still have elevators that are relay controlled. All the logic is relay, everything. In fact, I've got a video I'll go ahead and show you uh, after the slide of an elevator that's relay controlled. Now you still need a few relays. The reason is because the function of these relays is more taking the small output power from the PLC and let it control a much bigger current flow to, say, a big motor or something. Okay, So there's still some contactors, uh, still some relays, essentially, in the control cabinet, but their purpose is not for logic. It's just amplification of the PLC's brain, if you will, the PLC's output. Okay, And you can see that this is laid out a whole lot nicer than this is. There's still wires going everywhere, but at least you can kind of trace and figure out where things are going and what they're doing. And of course you can connect to that PLC and see what the program is inside of it. So um, another big thing about PLCs versus relay logic, it's really not hard to sell based on the price, but another big thing is the fact that there's increased reliability. Remember I told you last time that when computers were made out of relays, you could get a bug in the program that was a, an insect between contacts which would cause your program to fail. It would mess up one bit, and that's enough to make a whole program not work as you expect. So there's a lot higher reliability with a PLC, plus a PLC is solid state. So when a mechanical relay switches, it's physical contacts making and breaking. There's always some arcing, there's some wear. The relays are only good for so many cycles. How many cycles or how many bit flips do you think is going on in front of you, in that computer right in front of you right now with it just sitting there? Billions upon billions, right? And yet, it can do that from here till probably till the thing's obsolete and it still works and you don't really want it to, right? So, PLCs being, again, you know, more like a computer in solid state, have much higher uh, reliability. And of course, it's much less likely to make a wiring mistake with a PLC. Now, there's still bugs. <laughs> People still make PLC programs that have something wrong, but it's easier to change and, and correct. Now it's very easy to connect to it. You've got all kinds of input and output devices. Here's a bunch of output devices like a contact or a light, a solenoid, or input devices, devices like push buttons, limit switches, and sensors. And we'll talk about all these more later, but it's nice because you can just basically wire them into the PLC and they're ready to go. They're at the address that you wire them to. Okay, so they're pretty simple. So again, if you have to replace you know, 10 or so relays, a PLC is by far the way to go. Another nice advantage of PLCs is you can add on a module that gives it the ability to talk to a network. So a lot of times you can sit behind your desk and program the PLC that's out on the floor and you don't even have to go out there. You can see what it's doing, you can see how it's operating, you can troubleshoot and everything right from your desk. Another nice thing is, is the remote control and the ability of PLCs to talk to each other and to talk to other devices. That's another big advantage uh, of PLCs. Another thing is the faster response time. If you think about a relay, the switch takes time to go from one position to the other. Does that make sense? It's not a really long time by comparison to your my movements. It's pretty fast, but it's still time. Inside of the PLC, since it has essentially solid state switches, those things can change state in a heartbeat or a lot less than a heartbeat. One of the problems with the original relay control was when you sent something, it took some time for the relays to change state so that they responded to that. If you've got bottles flying by and a sensor is triggered, you may have missed it. So the speed of response is a huge advantage of PLCs over 
uh, relays. And I probably will end up making some type of quiz every week that kind of quizzes you on the, the salient points of the presentation. So make sure if you have questions, you ask. So obviously PLCs are easier to troubleshoot because essentially the program is a schematic of how the thing works. And you can figure out how things are wired and whether they're <coughs> wired correctly or not. I have a, a friend, she was a lady back in high school. She and her husband, they were quite a bit older than me, but she played saxophone for the band that I, I mixed for in high school. And uh, her husband, at the time I didn't understand what he did, but she said, yeah, he's a PLC person. He's the most valuable guy at their company. I guess this company had one big machine that was their main value producing device. And he was the guru of the program. Now that they needed to change that program every now and then, update it, make it better, make it more efficient, you know, add new features, whatever. And apparently she said that when that program was printed out, it was about that thick on eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. But he knew every line of code, knew what everything did. And back then, there were very few, few people who knew how to program PLC. So he was, he was the valuable guy, right? He was the one that paid the big bucks for maintaining this thing. That's actually still true today in the sense that you can make quite a lot. You can make a career out of programming and dealing with automation and PLCs. Um, one of the things we do when we bring you into this program is we teach you CAD skills. Why do we do that? Well, because CAD is a reasonable entry point to the engineering field, right? You might go work for a company for a couple of years, and once they find out you're in an engineering program, you've been doing CAD all this time, they'll give you more and more responsibility pretty soon, you're an engineer, right? And you, you, work, you work your way up in, in price very quickly. So a CAD operator might start out at, at you know, $40,000 a year or so, okay? You know what PLC programmers usually start out at? 70 to 80, about double that, okay? So you can actually go out with the skill set I'm showing you and get an entry-level PLC programming or automation job and go up very quickly that way too. So this is another really good entry point to the engineering area. Now, if you absolutely hate this class because you hate computers and you hate programming, it's probably not the right field for you, but just wanted you to know that there is significant potential. All right. So that's everything from that presentation. There are a few more presentations. I'm going to go through these quickly. But before I do, let me show you something. I showed you the schematic ladder last time. And now you see more how it looks like ladder logic. Where so far, all I've done is program one line, right? I explained to you last time how that worked. Let me show you something more near and dear to my heart. I, uh, I'm a really odd person in that I practice all the stuff that I teach it here. I practice it at home. I do stuff with it. So one of the things I did, I may have told you guys, I bought a, a heat pump years ago and also bought a wood gasification boiler. So I've got two or three sources of heat for my home. And I really didn't want to go out and buy a really expensive thermostat to be able to connect to all three sources of heat. See, the, the heat pump, what it does when you turn it on is it pulls thermal energy from outside, upgrades the temperature, and puts it in the house. If you understand thermo a little bit, you understand what I just said. If not, don't worry about it. It's a heater for the house. Another heater is the wood gasification boiler. But for that, I've got to go out and load the thing, which I don't really like to do. So these last few weeks or so, when it's been mild temperature, I just let the heat pump run. I don't bother loading the boiler. It kills my back at the beginning of this, the loading season, so I'm trying to recover still. But anyway, uh, the other source, you see, when the, when the boiler runs, you actually want it to run full tilt. You don't want it to throttle down. If you, any of you guys have a wood stove at home, there's usually some, some uh, knobs on the front you can open or close to control how much air goes in. Well, it turns out it's actually better to let as much air in as possible. You'll actually burn the wood more efficiently. You don't really want it to smoke because when smoke comes out of the chimney, that is unburned fuel. Okay, so I don't want my boiler to smoke because, again, I don't want to load as much wood, right? I want to load the smallest amount of wood possible. So when I run my boiler, I run it full tilt, right? As much air in as possible, as much heat out as possible. But of course, if I put all that heat in my home, I would be a cooked chicken pretty quickly. Okay? It outputs heat at a much higher rate than my house needs it. So I buried two 500-gallon propane tanks behind my house. I insulated them really well. And I didn't put propane in them. I put water in them. And what happens is when the boiler's running but the house doesn't need heat, the, the, the warm water is put into the tanks instead. The, the water in the tanks is warmed up. And that way, it's kind of like a battery or a thermal storage system. Okay? That's what it really is. And so really, I've got three sources of heat. I got heat pump, I got boiler, I got hot water in the tanks. How do you choose? Do I want to go downstairs and switch a valve and you know do, I don't know, be some kind of plumber all the time heating my house? No, I want it to work automatically. So I actually bought a little Click Coil PLC, a lot like the ones in front of you. 
and added a bunch of modules to it, and that's what controls my heating system. I programmed it out, and uh, I'm going to show you an older version of the program. I've, of course, made many changes along the way, but here's an older version uh, of the program and what it looks like. You'll kind of recognize it because you saw the click Coyos. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit so you can really see it. But this is actually a screenshot or a printout, I don't remember which, from the Click programming software. Now, I'm not going to show you everything, but here's some of the stuff. You might recognize these commands that I've got here. There's an inverting command and a not inverting command. I've got an input, X101. I've got another input, X103. What are these? Well, this is an input from the thermostat requesting low cool because you see my PLC also controls the heat pump, which is also the air conditioner. So the PLC has to realize, are we calling for heat or are we calling for cool? If we're calling for heat, I've got to select between three different things. If we're calling for cooling, I've got to set the heat pump into the right mode so it's actually cooling. You see, so this is a request from the thermostat for low cooling. There's a request here from the thermostat for low heating. Now, obviously, the thermostat doesn't call for both at the same time, right? That would be really bad. Okay. But regardless of which one is requested, notice, notice both are low. Well, what that means is there's potentially a request for the low stage of the heat pump to come on, the compressor. The compressor I have actually has two stages, kind of like full tilt and slow, okay, high and low speed. And so the compressor, actually it's more efficient, not the boiler, but the compressor is efficient to run at reduced rate. It's, it's cheaper that way. So if the thermostat is just calling for low cooling or a little bit of heat or a little bit of cooling, then I just turn on the low stage compressor. But if the, compre if the thermostat is calling for a high cooling or a high heat, then I end up turning on the high stage. Now notice I just said the word OR. I know there are other conditions in here, but neglect those for just a minute. This is an OR configuration. If I want low cooling or if I want low heating, turn on the low stage. You see how that's a logical statement? If I want a lot of heat or a lot of cooling, OR, that's that structure, it's called an OR structure, turn on the high stage of the compressor. There's other things here you haven't seen. For example, this is an edge detector. This is a timer. You'll see all this a little bit later. Don't worry about it right now. There are bits here. That's what these C's stand for. They're just memory locations you can use to remember things. But you see that there's a bunch of different logic. And the logic is just how it's wired. Okay? And we'll learn about all this a little bit later. But you see I've got multiple rungs for controlling several different outputs. A good rule of thumb for your PLC program is you'll have uh, about the number, maybe 100, 150% of the number of outputs, that's how many rungs you'll have. You see, each rung has its own output. So if I have an output like uh, sending something to the air handler that's requesting heat, well, that's going to be its own output. It will have its own rung. So however many outputs you have in the physical world that are wired to the PLC, that's how many rungs you'll have at least. Okay. So anyway, I just wanted to show you guys that... Uh, this programming stuff is, is useful. It's something you can actually use at home if you want to. Okay, I do. Um, I think I've got maybe, I'm estimating $300 or so in all the PLC stuff I bought. And for a PLC that does what mine does, that's a very low price. I guarantee you I've saved it many times over from burning wood and <laughs> not having to pay for heat to heat my home. So, I like it. And you can do a lot with it. Let's quickly go through manually operated switches, mechanically operated switches, and then output control devices. I won't talk near as much through this, but basically here's the standard symbols for normally open, normally closed, and a break make switch. A break make switch is something that actually has two sets of contacts so that in the default condition it's made, and then when you push it, it breaks contact and then makes contact on the other. There's also make before break switches, but don't worry about that right now. You've already seen normally open, normally closed switches. Here's another type of switch where the contacts inside of it, there's actually an A and a B set of contacts. And as you rotate the selector switch, what happens is you have contact on A, you move it to, to 2, and it moves to an intermediate position where neither one is made. And then when you move it to 3, it goes all the way down and B contacts are made. So you can, if you're looking at A and B, you can tell what position the switch is in by both of those. Uh, then there's also what's called dual, in, dual inline package. These are dip switches. 
These are not as common anymore. You probably shouldn't worry about these. You used to have to worry about these if you had to set PLC options. But these are used on circuit boards, so don't worry about that too much. Um, mechanically operated switches. There are a whole lot of switches that are used for operating or sensing, essentially, the machine. Because if you think about it, you've got two different types of inputs. Inputs from human beings telling the machine what to do, or command inputs. Whereas you've got control inputs, which are really what's coming from the, the machine that's giving you feedback. So you may have heard the term limit switch. How many of you have, have your own 3D printer? Anybody? A couple of you do, okay. Several of you have used the 3D printers in the labs, right? Did you know that they have limit switches? So they home initially. Mm -hmm. That's what they do is they move until they trip the switch. That way they know their position. Well, that's a limit switch. That's all it really is. Limit switches are really common. Now, the limit switches you've seen are probably really small. These are more industrial where you've got an arm that rotates, that's pushed, and causes the switch to change state. Again, you can have normally open or normally closed switch contacts. There are temperature switches, and one thing important about a temperature switch, these are usually set so that they change state at a given temperature. So this is not a temperature sensor in the sense that it's going to output, oh, the temperature is 75 degrees today. Okay, It doesn't work that way. What it does is when the temperature goes from below 70 to above 70, for example, it turns on. And when it drops down back below, it turns off again, okay? So this is an on-off switch, and typically you can set the temperature at which it changes state. There are also pressure switches, and again, it's not to sense, oh, there's 14.5 PSI in your tire or 30 PSI in your tire. These are, again, things you can set, and that's what this knob is for back here, so you can set the pressure at which it changes state from on to off or vice versa. <clears throat> these are interesting. I have never used one of these before, but you can see how they work. These are level switches, and the way they work is you hang them down in the tank. And what happens is, as the, the level of liquid rises, it inverts it, and these things float, okay? And so they, they turn over. Now, they often have a uh, weight on them, so they stay down. But this part is buoyant and, and turns, and when it turns, it changes state. Its, its output state changes from on to off or off to on. Okay, so it's called a float switch. It's not the float switch like you might see on your toilet <laughs> or the float switch like you might see in your, your sump pump. Now, this is different. This is an actual switch that floats. But you see these are not active yet. They're still hanging down. These two are active because they're floating up. So you can sense what the level in the tank is from those, depending on which float switches on or off. The last set of slides is the output slides. We'll go through those and then we'll run over to the ECT lab. We'll grab the materials for making our seal in circuits and we'll do that. Okay, so output control devices. There are many different types of output devices. There's more than I can show you. Okay? Um, in fact, there's more input devices than I showed you. There are switches that are um, that, that sense ferrous material, or sen switches that sense non-ferrous, they're non-contact switches. And so they're not like limit switches where you have to push on them to change their state. They just sense whether or not something's in front of them. But anyway, output devices, this is what's called a pilot light. Now it doesn't mean a pilot light like, like, like a pilot that would uh, start your furnace or something. Okay? It's just a light that's an, an indicator light. So you can see that the machine is on. Here's a relay symbol. So this is control relay one, there's the coil for it. And this relay would change the state of these switches when it's active. When power is passing through that coil, it'll change this normally open switch so it's closed, and this normally closed switch will open up. Now, some relays are set up this way so that the two switches have a common terminal, but most are not. Most of them separate these switches out, okay? Well, that's not really true. I shouldn't say that because we've already seen a bunch of relays that have a normally closed, a normally open, and a common terminal. So that's more what that's talking about, I guess. I was thinking of these as two separate switches. Here's a motor starter coil that would go on a motor starter and the associated overload relay from the overload module. But those are just uh, symbols for the output devices. This is a standard alarm symbol, heater symbol, solenoid symbol. I'll show you what a solenoid symbol is in a minute. Solenoid valve. When I first saw this, I thought, boy, that's wrong. They put the line through the solenoid valve. I'm used to seeing the line through the valve. The reason is because I'm used to looking at process or piping and instrumentation diagrams where you're looking at the piping and you're looking at the fluid flow. This is looking at the electrical flow, so actually this is correct because you might wire it up so that you can activate the solenoid and either open or close the valve. Here's a motor symbol and an uh, alarm horn symbol. 
a solenoid is just basically a device that, that's a coil. When you apply power, it pushes a rod out or pulls it in, okay, either one. Um, in fact, there's a solenoid, there's a bunch of solenoids at Chuck E. Cheese. Have you guys been there recently? I take my daughter there every now and then because she still enjoys it. They've got a, a whack-a-mole version that is Minions. And so they've got the good Minions on one side and the bad Minions on the other. And they pop up, and if it's a purple Minion, you've got to push it down. But if it's a good Minion, you don't, okay? So you never know if it's going to turn and pop up, good side or bad side. So you've got to watch.